Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, welcome to the Levin College and to this forum program, Smoke on the Water. I'm Wendy Kellogg. I'm on the faculty here and also director of a small water resilient cities program that this is part of what we're trying to do and convening things about water. I want to thank Molly Schnoak, who's over there at the table, who's our forum coordinator, and she handles all the logistics and helps uh, people like me figure out how to put these things together. So she's done a great job. Um, for those of you who are younger than 40, and there's a few of you out there, um, you might not recognize the reference to that famous Deep Purple song of the same name, arguably one of the most recognized opening guitar riffs in all of rock and roll history. Google it if you don't know it. Um, and like any good rock and roll tune, it tells a good story. Likewise, every river has a story that gets told again and again over time. And telling that story creates meaning for the people who live and work along its banks. And of course, the story changes over time, reflecting changes in the river's biophysical condition, in the social and economic experiences of river users, and the meaning that people ascribe to their interactions with that body of water. And each river is then a unique social ecological system that evolves over time through a complex relationship between natural forces and human action. It is, however, our perception of that relationship between ourselves and the river that guides what we value about the place and what we do in order to make the place better or not, uh, including policies, laws, and management. So today we're going to hear about several rivers in the Great Lakes each with a unique yet somehow similar story. Uh, these are stories of hope and settlement, of degradation and loss, and ultimately stories of restoration. Dr. John Hardig, our keynote speaker, will share his recent work that focuses on several Great Lakes rivers and the policy and political processes that are leading to their restoration. He has more than 30 years experience working on restoration of Great Lakes and the Great Lakes rivers. And I first met him when I was a graduate student and have appreciated his work all these years. He's been a river keeper <laughs> involved in remedial action plans, an integral player in the work uh, that's sponsored by the Inter International Joint Commission, which is the binational organization for the lakes and a professor and scholar. After he finishes, we'll have a conversation more specifically about the Cuyahoga. <clears throat> and our guest panelists, who you will meet then, have deep expertise on this river, its valley, and the importance to Cleveland's own revitalization. The conversation will drill down to more local activities in our own river uh, in terms of the role of public agencies, nonprofits, and the press in creating a complex governance network that's changing the narrative about the river uh, over the last several decades. And their activities have added new stories to the ones we tell ourselves, thereby changing the meaning we ascribe to this critical, important resource for our region and the, the Cuyahoga as a place. So after Dr. Harding speaks, I'll ask our panelists to come up on the stage. Um, I'll ask them to introduce themselves, but uh, as they tell us a little bit about first about the work uh, they have done about the Cuyahoga and how they relate to that river. Um, and then I have a set of questions to start, uh, but we'll eventually get to the point where all of you can ask questions of our panelists um, as we proceed. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. John Hardick. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here and uh, to talk about this. Uh, uh, in the uh, 50th anniversary, of the burning of the Cuyahoga. And where I come from, in Detroit, uh, we have uh, same year, and you'll hear about that, is the, the 50th burning, anniversary of the burning of the Rouge River. So uh, um, anyways, um, there we go. Yeah, we all know that the, uh, Great Lakes represent one-fifth standing fresh water on the Earth's surface. There's nothing like it, um, it and around. And uh, 
you know, these Great Lakes literally powered our economic growth in Canada the United States. They were instrumental in, 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 in the growth of our two nations. But, you know, uh, human development, uh, natural resource use and exploitation and industrial expansion led to some unintended consequences. And they're probably, uh, uh, they're manifest most in these three rivers that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, um, uh, the pollution is key. I'm going to talk about a little bit about the Buffalo River, uh, uh, the Cuyahoga and the Rouge River in southeast Michigan. But it was uh, January 24th, 1968, and it was a cold winter day. And this is a picture taken a couple of months before uh, the fire on the Buffalo River. And you can actually see the oil there floating on the surface, and you can see the banks of the river with lots of oil there. And uh, uh, a workman dro dropped his acetylene torch and ignited the river. Uh, back then, they quantified that uh, 5,500 kilograms per day of oil and grease were being discharged to this pretty small river. The Buffalo River is not a big river. It's a small one. So the fire uh, closed it for several days, but it was no big deal. It didn't get a lot of attention. Um, uh, uh, back then, the uh, Federal Water Pollution Control Administration, that's the predecessor of US EPA, had this to say about it in 1968. The Buffalo River is a repulsive holding basin for industrial and municipal waste. It is devoid of oxygen and almost sterile. Oils, phenols are present in large amounts. Uh, you probably know the story of the Cuyahoga River. Uh, 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 next month, 50 years, next month is, is the 50th anniversary, and uh, um, wooden debris had impinged on a railroad trestle and some lots of oil on the surface and sparks from a train passing over ignited the uh, oil and the wood and the flames uh, shot five stories into the air. It lasted uh, only 30 minutes but caused uh, $50,000 of damage, and that's the... Uh, uh, the fire at the uh, tail end there. But there were nine other times when the Cuyahoga caught on fire, starting in 1868. This, this picture on the right here is the most infamous one, and it always gets confused with the, uh, the 69 fire, right? I mean, you'll see this in magazines. It's not really, the, but it's from 1952. This was a five-alarm fire that caused 1.5 million dollars of damage in 1952. Uh, then that same year, 50 years ago this year, uh, in October, uh, same story, the, the Rouge River, uh, uh, sparks from a settling torch that was dropped ignited uh, oil that was floating on the uh, surface of the Rouge River. Again, uh, 50 feet in the air, the, flame, the flames, it took 10 pieces of fire department uh, Equipment and this boat right here is the John Kendall, the fire boat from Detroit, trying to contain the fire. You don't put it out, it burns itself out, but trying to contain it on the lower uh, Rouge River. You can see the Ford Motor Company stack there and the drawbridge that goes over the Rouge. Uh, the Detroit Free Press, the local paper there, said when you have a river that burns for crying out loud, you have troubles. It happened on Ky Cleveland's Cuyahoga, and now it has happened on our. Uh, Rouge River. So what has happened on these three river systems uh, since we saw smoke on the water? Um, the Buffalo River, again, is not a really big river. Um, uh, the Buffalo, uh, uh, it was an early trading post. It was obviously the terminus of the Erie uh, Canal. Uh, it opened the interior of the continent can't tell you how important that was to settling the continent. Uh, it provided safe and reliable passage for uh, uh, a num many people and goods. Uh, it also was called the Queen City of the Lakes. It had an early shipbuilding history. Uh, it became the grain storage capital, uh, literally, of the world, uh, and a lead leading miller of grains in the mid-1800s. Um, 
At the peak of the maritime area, era in Buffalo in the 1800s, it was the fourth largest port in the world. Thinking of people and goods coming across from New York through the Erie Canal, coming to Buffalo, getting on steamers and going across. Again, uh, it was the queen city of the lakes. It had lots of pollution, a small river. Uh, um, this, uh, there was a gentleman named Stanley Speziak who was a jeweler by trade. He lived in Buffalo, New York, but he was a passionate conservationist. He cared deeply about um, the Buffalo River, and uh, he couldn't understand there were no fish in the Buffalo River. It was the void of oxygen. And so he is the gentleman, uh, sort of the fourth from the left with the horn rim glasses. So can you imagine, here's a jeweler from New York who didn't have a lot of education, but he got the President of the United States to come, uh, Lyndon Johnson, and to Lyndon Johnson's right, you can see uh, uh, Lady Bird there, and then you see Rockefeller on the right there. There's some big names in that photo. But he brought them in, and um, his story, he says, I need to take you. The only way I can tell this story to you is if I take you and put you on a tugboat, and we're going to go in the middle of the Buffalo River. And this is the bucket of slop story. And, and so he takes them out on this tug, goes in the middle of the river, he anchors it, and they take a galvanized pail and dip it into the Buffalo River. Up comes all this oil and grease in it. Then he takes a wooden spoon, and he just puts the wooden spoon in the middle of the pail, and it comes up, and just the oil and the grease are dripping off the wooden spoon. And he goes, Mr. President, what do you think your policy is about this? Of course, the president didn't have an answer to that. I don't know what the policy is. You know, and he says, well, let me tell you what your policy is. You take all this, you put it in barges, you go out in the middle of Lake Erie, and you open up the bottom of the barge, and it all goes into the lake. And that's the same place we draw our drinking water. And, and oh my goodness. So Lyndon went back, and uh, President Johnson went back, and he signed a presidential executive order banning the um, uh, open water disposal of contaminated dredge materials. That's where it all started, was back at this story. Um, and that was a jeweler. So, but he wasn't done there. He, he was in it for the long haul. And he had a 50-year career at being a champion for the Buffalo River and Lake Erie. And so here he is with Bobby Kennedy, you know. Um, he would speak out loudly and, and get people to see, and so here they're on a boat on the Buffalo River, um, uh, uh, advocating for control of pollution. So, so what has happened since that time? Uh, in 1967, uh, again, you have to remember the Buffalo River is a small river, a lot of waste going into it, no oxygen. It's pretty much devoid of oxygen. So they put together this Buffalo River Improvement Corporation, which is a, a consortium of industries to work together to do pollution prevention, but also to increase the flow of the river. So that obviously helped. Back in the 60s, it was at its best, one milligram per liter of oxygen, but most of the time less, you know, anaerobic. Uh, after that, uh, in 72 and onwards, it was five milligrams per liter. So improvement of oxygen. They did lots of pollution prevention and control programs back in the 70s and 80s. Then the Remedial Action Plan program came along, that just like for the Cuyahoga, back in 1985. And in their case, the champion, the leader, the facilitator of that is the Buffalo Niagara uh, Waterkeeper. And um, they've done a terrific job of bringing everyone together. And they were actually the first nonprofit organization to be a champion, of, uh, a leader of a Great Lakes Legacy Act pro uh, project in the Great Lakes. So again, it was biologically dead in the 60s. And then as a result of these pollution prevention and control programs, uh, invertebrates started coming back, pollution sensitive ones. Um, the fishery, you can imagine, 
virtually devoid of oxygen, and they had New York State, DEC, they had uh, Buff State, Buffalo State, looking at the river on a regular basis. For five decades, they looked and could find no fish in the river. Can you imagine that? Five decades they went. Then one day, uh, uh, a young uh, high school kid caught a sheep's head and it made front page headlines in New York City because they finally found a fish. But so they went from no fish to now 20 to 30 species in the Buffalo River and peregrine falcons are back. So more recently again, this Buffalo Niagara uh, waterkeeper has worked with all the key partners and they have actually leveraged $75 million in recent years for contaminated sediment remediation and habitat restoration. Uh, here's a couple of examples of them right here. Um, so this cleaner river, all of a sudden, just like other places, people started to rediscover that they had a river in their backyard. People started to rediscover it and wanted to connect to it. Uh, they wanted to improve public access to it. And then this led to economic revitalization. Um, uh, they've quantified in Buffalo that between 2012 and 2018, over $428 million of waterfront redevelopment has occurred in the Buffalo River. And this would not have happened, would not have happened without the cleanup of the Buffalo River. Uh, I guess a picture is worth a a million words in this case. That's a photo on the left of uh, literally 2014 when they were working on still the cleanup of the Buffalo River, but you know, no use, no access. And then literally uh, uh, a few short years later, look what, what that is down at Riverworks in Buffalo, New York. Uh, incredible how that is. These stories of revitalization are really critical because Anyone who tracks uh, the funding at the federal level for Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and Great Lakes Legacy Act, those are always in jeopardy. There's always on the chopping block to be cut. The same is true in Canada, their Canada-Ontario Agreement and their Great Lakes Protection Initiative always in. So these stories of from cleanup to restoration to reconnection to revitalization become so important. Cuyahoga River. It had the Ohio and Erie Canal opened in 1825. It became a major port, one of the leading wooden shipbuilding centers in the Great Lakes. And back then it was known as Forest City. Um, Cleveland became the inevitable meeting place for coal and iron ore, just an industrial powerhouse focused in the flats. This is a great picture just to show from uh, Standard Oil back in 1889, but also an unintended consequence is that the Cuyahoga River became a flowing dump. Um, uh, Samsel Supply Company is still located down on the flats down there, and um, uh, Frank Samsel uh, cared, he, he made his living on the Cuyahoga River and Lake Erie, and he cared deeply about it, and he saw all this oil on the river and he said, oh my gosh, I can make a little money off that oil. And so he would go to like the Coast Guard and get paid to um, take a hose and a pump. You'll see on the back of that tug, there's a big holding tank. And he would uh, suck off the oil off the top of the, the surface of the Cuyahoga, put it into a holding tank and then sell it back, recycle it. And he, so he made money and he had five employees for uh, uh, for 10 years, but worked himself out of a business. Uh, back then, in the 60s, uh, uh, there were 16,000 metric tons of oil and grease in uh, 590-some thousand, uh, 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 thousand tons of sediment that were dredged from the river. That's how much was in there. He named his vessel the Putzfrau, which in German means cleaning lady, and he, and he, wherever he went, he talked about how we need to care for the place we all call home. But another one, uh, this David Blauschild uh, uh, was an automobile dealer here in Cleveland, and 
he used to take out full page ads in the Cleveland Plain de Dealer saying, uh, uh, Lake Erie is dying. Back then he had his grandkids and he was concerned that they would never see, be able to fish in the river or see a frog or experience that. So uh, he uh, uh, worked with the Cleveland Plain Dealer to develop op-eds and, and, and raise public awareness and um, uh, uh, outcry over the pollution. Um, uh, here's another example of some of the, uh, um, uh, he, he took out billboards coming into and out of Cleveland that would say, let's stop killing uh, Lake Erie. So uh, a big campaign working with the media and others to raise awareness about that. So what has happened? Uh, Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District has spent over $2 billion with a B on wastewater treatment facilities and collection system improvements since 1972. More than $850 million has been spent on reducing combined sewer overflows uh, by nearly 50%. For those who don't know, combined sewer overflows, many old cities have, com they're combined, so if it rains and exceeds the carrying capacity, raw sewage doesn't go to the wastewater treatment plant, it bypasses at CSO uh, overflow points. Uh, uh, the district is now implementing a long-term combined sewer overflow program over a 25-year period for $3 billion. Uh, in, in recent years, more than $9 million has been spent on habitat restoration uh, with Ohio EPA, uh, Cuyahoga River Restoration, the Advisory Committee, and other partners. And also, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers annually dredges the lower river and, and for navigational purposes, but that removes contaminated sediment as well. Uh, in 1969, when the Cuyahoga River caught on fire last, there were few, if any, fish in the lower river. Today, there are 70 or more species, uh, and many uh, pollution-sensitive ones as well. There are also pollution-sensitive invertebrates, macrobenthic, macro big, benthic living on the bottom. You can see it with an eye, invertebrates uh, uh, in many reaches. And we have seen uh, the return of peregrine falcons, osprey, and bald eagles in the watershed in the valley. Uh, the flats now have resident blue and green heron, cormorants, and seasonal visits from migratory birds and waterfowl that weren't there before. Without the cleanup of the Cuyahoga River, the revitalization of the flats would not have been possible. Um, flats Forward has been championing that, um, and they have quantified that uh, $750 million in economic development since 2012, an additional $270 million in new projects in the works. So that's a billion dollars of economic uh, uh, revitalization in the flats, and what a great story. Rouge River, similarly, another burning river. Uh, it is located in southeast Michigan. It flows into the Detroit River. Uh, so the Detroit River, all the upper Great Lakes flow through the Detroit River down to Lake Erie. And this watershed goes into the Detroit River. It's uh, about 1,200 uh, square kilometers. There's 1.3 million people. There are 48 communities. That's a very big number and portions of three counties. Because it was the cutting edge of sprawl, there is 23% impervious surface. That's runoff. So ecologists talk about a 10% target for um, impervious surface. This is 23%. So remember that. Uh, Obviously, Henry Ford brought everything together there and uh, perfected the assembly line and he consolidated all operations to create the largest automobile manufacturing plant in the world at that time um, uh, called the Ford Rouge plant. That's the, at the mouth. Uh, during World War I, uh, submarine chasers called Eagle Boats were constructed along there. Then Detroit became the epicenter of the arsenal of democracy. Uh, more bombers, jeeps, ammunition were built in Detroit than any other place in the United States. And uh, 
that took its toll on the Rouge River. Um, uh, tipping points, this, this point in time where there is an urgent need to take action. And if you don't do anything, you could see irreversible harm to an ecosystem. Well, there are two of them uh, on the Rouge R uh, River that, we, that come to mind. In 1940, so I think it was right at the end of World War II, right after World War II, 46 to 48, they quantified 5.9 million gallons of oil and petroleum products were being discharged. That means dumped into the Rouge River and into the Detroit River. That's a huge number. One gallon of oil is enough to pollute a million gallons of water. So that meant there was enough going in the Rouge and Detroit Rivers to pollute the entire western basin of Lake Erie, all Ohio waters, all Michigan waters, all Ontario waters. So 1948, these pictures are from 1948. It was a cold winter and the waterfowl come down. Detroit River is the intersection of two migratory flyways, bird flyways, and the waterfowl came through and there was only a few pockets of open water and what was in there? Oil and grease. They landed and 12,000 ducks and geese died in one event, one weekend. A bunch of hunters who loved the river collected those oil-soaked carcasses of ducks and geese, threw them in their pickup truck, drove to the capital of Michigan, Lansing, upper corner, started throwing them on the sidewalk, threw them on the front steps, threw them at the front door, called a press conference and say, how dare you allow this to happen to the place we call home, the place where we're raising our families. Today, they're credited with starting the Industrial Pollution Control Program of Michigan, a tipping point. People spoke out, they started the Industrial Pollution Control Program. Another one, Rouge became a health hazard. I, I mentioned to you that how much impervious surface there was, uh, how many people, 1.3 million people, 23% impervious surface, all these combined sewer overflow points. 168 totally. Well, um, uh, there was a, two cities that sort of bordered the Rouge in the lower end were Dearborn, which is home to Ford Motor Company, world headquarters, and Melvindale, another city. So it was um, 1985, and it was a warm summer evening, and a lot of these residents did not have air conditioning, so they kept their windows open, and they started smelling this incredible thing, and of course they're in the shadow of the Rouge plant and a steel plant and the largest refinery in Michigan, and it has to be an industry, right? And so they complained, and, and, and uh, they got no satisfaction from the response from governments. So they put together a petition, and this was not some simple petition. It was this thick. And they weren't, nobody from the county or the city or the state would respond, so they gave it to the regional administrator of US EPA, Val Adamkus, put it on his desk and say, you've got to come look at this. So he sends a team in and they look at the watershed and they look at all the air emissions and they say, well, it's not an air problem. What is it? What had gone on is so much raw sewage was coming into the Rouge River that it was totally anaerobic and there was, in the absence of oxygen, hydrogen sulfide forms and that's the smell of rotten eggs, and that was the cause of it. That's the first part of the tipping point. The second one was a family was um, sort of, the Rouge River has a park system that goes along it as well. Part of it is the floodplain. So a family was going into the Rouge uh, park system and was gonna picnic on a day. It was 1985, and um, uh, they're having a nice day, and they were walking along the banks of the Rouge River, and it was you know, a little bit of a drop down to the actual water level, it was a little slippery. He fell in to the Rouge, got up, and um, dried off, and no big deal. They finished their picnic and went home. Two days later, he started getting deathly sick, died on the third day from leptospirosis, rat fever. Um, all the governments, now you have to think about this, 
How many, 48 communities, three counties all said, well, it couldn't be the Rouge River. Everyone knew it was all the raw sewage in that. And um, uh, that and this odor problem, realizing that there was no oxygen in the river because of all this raw sewage was a tipping point. All 48 communities came together. Instead of um, doing it on a piecemeal basis, they took an ecosystem approach and brought all the stakeholders together. All the mayors of all 48 communities were on one committee, the Rouge River Basin Committee. Um, they did a study then and said, okay, the big player was at the mouth of the Rouge River. The big player was the city of Detroit. So they looked at the quantity and quality of combined sewer overflows in the watershed, like how much was coming in and how many, what was the, the loading of pollutants to the river. It showed this study, if Detroit implemented CSOs for tens of millions of dollars at that point in 1985, it would have no measurable improvement in the Rouge River because it takes a watershed. It takes everyone. That, the rest is history. They came together, they worked on it. Um, one of the drain commissioners from one of the counties named Jim Murray uh, uh, was, a, was a champion for it. Um, over time, this Rouge River institutional structure framework evolved through the Rouge River Basin Committee, which was all the mayors. They had a Friends of the Rouge who is do doing a terrific job um, Rouge River Advisory Council to the Rouge River National Wet Weather Demonstration Project. They got uh, money, federal money, to demonstrate combined sewer overflow pro uh, programs. Uh, uh, but the most important thing is they all joined together and went lockstep. They were the first watershed in the United States to have an NPDES permit. That's National Pollutant discharge elimination system permit. That's under the Clean Water Act. So a federal permit for all 48 communities in the watershed to deal with stormwater. The first ones to do it based on that. So uh, uh, they have a mechanism to coordinate sub-watershed planning, to monitoring, education, all of this under that. So during the 70s and 80s, the emphasis was on pollution prevention and control. And then with these, these two simultaneous tipping points, uh, they, uh, they started down the road of addressing combined sewer overflows. They knew it would not be ch cheap. So today, uh, in total, over 380 projects have been completed by 75 different organizations, communities, uh, counties, and different agencies at a cost of a billion dollars. They've invested already a billion dollars since 1985. Uh, th this cleanup has resulted in improved, obviously, water, sediment, and biological quality. The elimination of, of these uh, rotten egg smell, these obnoxious odors, has been, it's been eliminated. Uh, uh, they remediated contaminated sediments and the habitat restoration in this Newburgh Lake, which was a big impoundment. And yeah, it's the first section of the Rouge to uh, remove a health advisory for fish. Uh, they've had improved dissolved oxygen and the elimination of frequent fish kills in the river. And there's been some limited improvement in the macrobenthic invertebrate community and the fishery, but they still have a long ways to go. And some peregrine falcons are at the mouth. Here's one figure to show you just dissolved oxygen. Remember, during the 80s and early 90s, the Rouge River frequently went to zero in oxygen. So then in the absence of oxygen, hydrogen sulfide gets formed. That's the smell of rotten eggs. Many fish and invertebrates can't live it. So this is one station at Military Road. So in the 80s and early 90s, it was frequently zero. Now you see um, a, a, a gradual improvement to where most of the time it's above the five milligram per liter standard for protection of a warm water fishery. Uh, this Friends of the Rouge does a great program to do a winter stonefly search to, to look for these very pollution sensitive species and uh, 
Uh, they are finding them in more locations. It's a great example of citizen science, and, and it looks like they are expanding their range, which is good uh, sign for the Rouge. Again, the, the Friends of the Rouge now have been around for over 30 years, and, and they just build the capacity of governments to do many things, and they have uh, eight staff, and, and they do a terrific job in, 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 in uh, the watershed work. And, and obviously, today, people are rediscovering it as a, uh, as a recreational resource and also understanding that it provides ecosystem services to all of us. So these three stories, uh, they're, they're heartwarming. You, know, you can see improvement, but obviously we are not done. We have a lot to do to meet the long-term goals of restoring the physical, chemical, and biological integrity uh, of these waters, consistent with the Clean Water Act and the Canada-US Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Uh, uh, some challenges. We need to do everything possible to prevent pollution. Just think of the latest one, or PFAS. How many of you have heard of PFAS? And, I mean, my goodness, it comes out. And you know, again, a failure of policy to really prevent and to control contaminants at their source. We still need to remediate contaminated sediments and brownfields in the watershed. We need to adequately uh, control uh, non-point source pollution and build green infrastructure right now huge movement on green infrastructure. We need to rehabilitate and enhance uh, habitats and biodiversity and the long-term goal of sustainable development. Simply put, if we don't change to more preventative and sustainable design, planning, and management in these watersheds and communities, we will continue to react to tipping points and practice crisis management. Our challenge is to uh, uh, get on with sustainable development and to avoid the next tipping point. I get answered, what are the major accomplishments of that public outcry in Buffalo, Cleveland, and Detroit of the 1960s? My answer to that question would be the National Environmental Policy Act of 1970, the Clean Water Act, and the Canada-US Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, both of 1972 the Endangered Species Act of 1973. That's an amazing set of accomplishments for people speaking out and caring for waters in their backyard. So I get the next question is, what are the major accomplishments of the environmental movement today? And my take on that would be the expansion and proliferation of non-governmental organizations. Um, it's PACs, Cuyahoga River Restoration, Flats Forward, the Buffalo Niagara River Keeper, Friends of the Rouge, on and on, an alliance of Rouge communities. It's an amazing thing to build capacity to uh, be on top of things. Some thoughts on critical elements for success. Local ownership of decision-making process and a well-recognized community champion. If you have somebody like a Jim Murray in the Rouge community, who was a drain commissioner, who was known by all the communities, who can be your champion and open doors. That is really good. Cooperative learning, use of an ecosystem approach on a watershed scale, shared vision that you can carry in the hearts and minds of people and objectives, and complementary and reinforcing actions. Um, cooperative planning that shares responsibility for delivery of programs. Uh, partnerships that are built on trust and respect, stepwise approach to restoration of beneficial uses and achievement of long-term goals, and a dynamic tension between the proponents of this stepwise and incremental approach and the provocateurs who want to get it all done in one big step. You know, there has to be a dynamic tension there. Um, coupling, we've learned from this, whether it's the habitat issue, whether it's contaminated sediment issue, Whereas the brownfield issue, uh, all of those, the CSO issue, coupling of research and monitoring with management leads to better solutions. We need to strengthen that science policy linkage. Government responsiveness, not top-down command and control. Uh, some incentives, 
uh, that need to be provided, and then measuring and celebrating progress in a very public fashion towards uh, measurable uh, endpoints and targets. My lessons learned on this. Uh, Buffalo, Cleveland, Detroit are just excellent examples of building partnerships and fostering collaboration. That leads to success. River cleanup spurs reconnecting to waterways via greenways and blueways, these water trails that are spurring up everywhere, that leads to economic and community revitalization. Investing in cleanup of the Great Lakes in terms of its rivers, harbors, and embayments means investing in revitalization of Rust Belt communities. Uh, this last year, the uh, Great Lakes Commission and the Council of Great Lakes Industries released a report that showed that for every federal dollar spent on the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, that would return $3.35 in economic activity. It was a, over a year study, real quantitative, shows that there's a return on the investment and we need to sustain these programs to get to, the, to, to our long-term goals. Cleanup of polluted river, rivers and harbors can also change the perception from being recognized as polluted rivers and harbors in the Rust Belt to being regarded as healthy ecosystems that improve quality of life, celebrate history and culture, strengthen the economy, foster a sense of place, and help achieve long-term competitive advantage. Uh, each of these rivers literally were viewed as working rivers in the industrial habitat. Each were, had rivers that caught on fire. Now we're trying to change the perception of them. The uh, American Heritage River Initiative designation for the Cuyahoga is an attempt to change the perception. Uh, in Detroit, establishing International Wildlife Refuge is a uh, uh, an attempt to change the perception of these rivers and help. Thank you very much. So um, if you've been to a forum program before, you probably never knew that there was art back there that was the river and the lake. <laughs> so I thought we'd raise that up so you could see. Show it off. Show it off a bit, yeah. Um, okay, uh, so um, I'd like to first start with having our three other panelists here um, introduce themselves, but and while you're doing that, answer the question, if you could just describe briefly your uh, prior or current work related to the Cuyahoga River, which is basically why I asked you to be here today, what I know about you, and then we'll get into more detail and those things later. Jen, Jen Greiser. Okay, my name is Jen Greiser. I am the Senior Natural Resource Manager at Cleveland Metro Parks. But the reason I'm here today is that I also chair the Cuyahoga River Area of Concern Advisory Committee, which is a group of um, 24 members that represent um, local government, as well as private um, consulting firms, industry. We have nonprofits and members of the public too. I'm Steve Litt. I'm the art and architecture critic of the Plain Dealer here in Cleveland. And uh, I moved here in 1991, but I, I didn't really feel that I understood why Cleveland exists and why it's here uh, until uh, the fall of 1999 when I visited the then brand new Ohio and Erie Canal Reservation with uh, Patty Stevens, who some of you in the audience might recognize if you had snotting. Uh, Patty was with a landscape architecture fr firm called uh, Schmidt Copeland Parker Stevens, and she took me in her red Honda uh, uh, SUV uh, down into this uh, uh, beautiful new park in the <coughs> valley, and I just had this revelation of, oh, you mean the river that starts up there by the lake flows through here and then that goes into the national park. And I suddenly had this uh, revelation uh, of connection between uh, the landscape, the lake, and, uh, and, and the history of our area. So I proceeded to write a number of stories about that. Uh, I did a series in 2000 called Forgotten Valley, which 
didn't talk so much about water quality, but talked about what could happen on the land uh, around around the river. There it is. <laughs> and that's when I met uh, Jim Castellick here, and Paul Alcinas is shown in the canoe. Uh, we, we canoed the river, and uh, I flew over in a helicopter, and just had a lot of fun doing uh, tons of reporting. Since then, uh, I've continued to write about the towpath trail and um, other improvements along the riverbanks. And I will talk more about that uh, later on. And I will throw it to Jim. Okay. Hi, I'm Jim Costellic. Uh, I'm a research fellow and uh, a part-time instructor here at the college. And uh, before that, I, I had been working for the Cuyahoga County Planning Commission uh, back in, it was back in the late 80s, actually, um, that I began to really understand the importance of the Cuyahoga Valley, especially north of National Park, how it had been literally forgotten, as Steve said. And so we did a report, uh, it took almost three years to do, back in, it started in 89, and was uh, funded by the Cleveland Foundation and the Gunn Foundation and the BP Charitable Trust. And we actually um, documented an incredible amount of information about this area that was totally unknown to the public. I mean, when you look at it back then, there was absolutely no access to anywhere along the river, any public access all the way from um, Rockside Road, essentially where the National Park ended, at that time National Recreation Area. But there was no public access all the way from there to the lake. And it wasn't until 96, actually, that there was a uh, uh, new park that the city uh, established at Settler's Landing at the foot of St. Clair, uh, where uh, Lorenzo Carter built his cabin and, and uh, essentially became the important focal point for the Flats area to have public access. But up till then, there was none. And the Ohio and Erie Canal Reservation that Steve just mentioned, that. Uh, came out of that report. I know we, we recommended back in the late 80s and early 90s that uh, there's this pristine wilderness that existed that no one really knew about. And so uh, we began talking to Cleveland Metro Parks about that. And uh, as Steve said, the rest is history. It is preserved. It's an incredible resource. And uh, a lot has happened since then, which we can talk about as we go along here. Great. Thank you. Um, John, you had a, a whole list of critical success factors, and you hit all the ones that I could think of. Um, that, that was a great uh, great thing for people to take those things into consideration. If, if I'd like each of you to maybe talk a little bit from your perspective, what have been the things, either, John, if you can talk about the, um, the Rouge and the Buffalo River, um, and for you, the rest of you about the Cuyahoga, what are the of that long list, what have been, you think, the key things that have, in each case, that have really pushed the effort forward, that have, have made a difference in, in really either galvanizing the public or action in the political realm, whatever it is that you think has been uh, really important for that? I'd go back to uh, 1985 when the whole remedial action plan program started and, and you know, the. Uh, the state and federal governments in the United States and state and provincial governments in Canada uh, committed to develop a plan to restore all impaired beneficial uses. But they also committed to use an ecosystem approach that said, you know, account for the interrelationships between or among air, water, land, and all living things, including you and I, because we're in part of the ecosystem. And then also, involve all user groups in management. Prior to that, it was all top-down command and control programs out of federal and state government and stuff. But this, and, and, and Cleveland started out with the CRCPO, Cuyahoga River Community Planning Organization. So who are the key stakeholders in the watershed who are impacted by the Cuyahoga or or, or impact the Cuyahoga. Bring them to the table, but most importantly, let them become part of the solution. So you, one of the key things was this opening up of the process. Um, instead of a top-down command and control process, a bottom-up cooperative one, 
uh, sharing responsibilities, um, building capacity to do what we all want to do, and uh, and let the creative uh, juices fly. Then you know, like the way I look at it, we had 43 areas of concern. There's 43 different uh, locally designed ecosystem approaches on how to do it. You know, but it meets their needs. I think that was the instrumental in, in Galvin and getting public support. Great, thanks. I, I guess I would build off of that though, and as much as it's, it's great to have all of those entities involved and engaged, um, we, we had the, the, the RAP at the time, the Remedial Action Plan, now we just refer to it as the Advisory Committee. They've been working on the Cuyahoga River and removing these impairments since 1987. Um, that's a long time, and we actually did not celebrate the first removal of any impairments until 2017, so decades later. And um, I think that some of the more recent success, you know, we, we got through that regulatory period where we really needed the cleanup of those point sources of pollution, and um, now we're in that phase of the, the stormwater and more of that non-point source pollution and um, where we still need that federal investment. And so that's something with the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Um, now, not only in the Cuyahoga, but across these areas of concern and other places in the Great Lakes, really being able to leverage those federal dollars with local match where it's appropriate and and see improvements in, through restoration and being able to measure those improvements through monitoring. Um, so that I think is a really big thing that with that investment year after year of $300 million and more has been really critical and, and encouraged to see that it's been bumped up a little bit for this year. The other thing I'll mention, um, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to you, is um, just that we're very blessed in Cuyahoga to have people that have been dedicated for that long, that haven't left the table, and, and they, they bring us that firsthand experience when the Cuyahoga River was an oozing mess and, and the, the, the sewage system of, of Northeast Ohio. And, um, and, and that's one, one caution I have is that we, we need to hold on to that memory so that we don't revert back to it. Yeah, so uh, I, I can follow on to the, the comment about, uh, about memory. I recently visited with Jim the uh, Watershed Stewardship Center in, in Parma, uh, which is run by Metro Parks, and they have a, a little TV screen there where they, they flash up images of some of the local environmental heroes who have been working uh, tirelessly in, in the uh, NGOs, you, call, you would call them, I would call them CDCs or uh, other organizations like, like the RAP. And, um, it, you know, these are the people who get up every day and this is, this is what they're doing, whether they're paid a lot of money to do it or not, in most cases not. Uh, I would also say that uh, since we're talking about bottom up versus top down, uh, it's you, you got to have that pressure from from the bottom from the neighborhoods from the communities and uh, having a trail system and having access to water and uh, uh, being able to see these resources and to use them is incredibly important in building uh, public support but the few leaders at the top of our uh, local government organizations agencies uh, uh, elected officials and so on are incredibly imp important and powerful people who can stop these things or delay progress for, for years. Uh, or on the other hand, they can make exciting things happen. Uh, I was reminded uh, during some recent reporting on this of the role that John Devo played when he became the superintendent of what was then the Cuyahoga Valley National Recreation Area in 1988. Eight. In 1988. And he saw the towpath trail going through the park and he says, you know, this needs to be connected to Cleveland and Akron. And if not for that, I, I, that level of buy-in from a federal, a federal official, I don't know that we would be seeing the completion of, or nearing the completion of a magnificent off-road trail system that, that is now developing uh, in Cleveland and Cuyahoga County. So individuals matter at all levels of this story. And piggybacking on that, um, 
uh, the heroes go back to, to the 70s when people like John Cyberling, Congressman Cyberling, uh, you know, took it upon himself to uh, preserve the area between Cleveland and Akron as a, as a national recreation area that eventually became a national park. And then uh, several years later, back in the, in the mid-90s, it was uh, Ralph Regula, congressman from uh, down around Canton. And uh, Congressman Regula helped to establish the Cuyahoga Valley National Heritage Corridor. Uh, and so he was heavily involved in bringing millions of dollars to this area uh, to enhance public access of this tremendous resource and help communities around it uh, acclimate to losing tax base, you know, because that was one of the problems. A lot of the communities down in the valley said, gee, we don't want, we don't want this land taken from us because that's where we're going to build our future shopping malls and, and housing developments that are really important for us to grow. And so they came up with a plan called payment in lieu of taxes. Uh, the idea was to, uh, to actually give money to these local communities to offset that loss of taxes. And the enhanced environment around there eventually led to uh, additional development around the national park and some of the highest property values now in this area uh, are on the fringes of the national park because people want to live close to it. And so that's really important. And, and also to follow up on what Steve's point, uh, back, I think it was back in the late 90s, I was asked to take a contingent of uh, people from the Czech Republic. They were cabinet officials uh, to show them around the Cuyahoga Valley. And I remember driving down to Canal Road and we got out and we were looking at Mill Creek and the banks of Mill Creek had all these streamers on it, you know, like white streamers. And they said, what is that? And I hated to say it, but it was the result of uh, a recent storm that had flushed out the uh, combined sewer overflow at Mill Creek Falls, one of the largest waterfall in Cuyahoga County, and it was toilet paper. And so they said, well, we have that problem too. So uh, they're trying to make me feel better, I think. But it was just amazing to me how we had to do something, and thank God the uh, EPA and the uh, Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District have closed that off now, uh, and the, the water from Mill Creek that flows directly into Cuyahoga is much cleaner and much safer, and we're seeing fish and everything migrate up, upstream. So those are really important things to, you know, little things, but they make a big, big difference. Um, all of your comments, um tend me to think about an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You think about the numbers of dollars and the hours that people have devoted to clean up these magnificent places. Um, and it's, it's kind of staggering, really, that, that they would have uh, been in such trouble that, that we just didn't make sure that those things were protected because we had other priorities or um, neglect for the many different reasons why things got to be that bad but how much money and time and effort it has taken to start restoring these places that now we find of tremendous value um, and how important it is there's a gnat flying around here how important it is that we make sure we don't uh, waste that money right that we still need to invest more and more um, as we go through I'm really intrigued by the, the shift that you started talking about, John, um, with the RAP program. And I think it's, it's something that we today don't think is unusual. But no. the shift from thinking of the, the role of the federal government as command and control and telling, or telling local governments and states how to do things. It's not just setting standards, but it was, it literally was use these technologies, use these methods. And when I studied the RAPs, when I did my dissertation, and that was one of the things that really stood out was, this is a completely different model. You come in and say, use an ecosystem approach. Um, and there was no huge amount of money that was given for RAPs. It was, you have to find the money out of the normal sources of funding that you use for everything else. And it forced, at the time, that didn't sound very encouraging, but it forced all the stakeholders, all the agencies and organizations at the local level to collaborate. And now we think that's just how you do business. 
and, and who would think of doing it a different way? So I'm, I'm really intrigued about that. And if you guys could just talk a little bit more about the other rivers you've studied and, and what's happened locally in, in terms of the, the governance of these, these rivers and the kinds of stakeholders that you have found have been really helpful and, and resourceful in bringing that collaboration to be. To be. I'd just like to add to that a little bit, Wendy, that you know, um, there are so many issues out there, right? And, and to get, get attention, to make something a priority, these rivers and harbors and were not a priority, you know? And, and to r raise it. So starting down the process of, a, of the RAP, the Remedial Action Plan, you know, develop a, a plan and then implement it and chase money. But through that, you know, cooperatively, they were able to raise the profile of these areas of concern and finally get the attention it finally deserved when, under the Great Lakes Regional Collaboration that led to the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and the Great Lakes Legacy Act, and now that's $2.3 billion that have come in to help um, leverage other funds, whether it be state funds or city funds or county funds or foundation dollars or private sector dollars to do what we all should have been doing in the first place. But that was, um, uh, it, it's hard to make the case in Washington, D.C. and Ottawa, Ontario, that we need money to do this. There's so many competing. This, these groups speaking out and, and raising the profile of these problems and then getting people to understand what it's going to take to address combined sewer overflows or contaminated sediment or loss of habitat what, or stormwater, whatever it is. That, would, that was really an important part of the process. I'm going to diverge away from the area of concern a little bit and just speak more generally to Northeast Ohio and the watershed organizations that are here because um, we really have a great, not only a great wealth of freshwater, but a, a corresponding great wealth of these watershed organizations. Small groups that are either true nonprofits or they're watershed groups that are supported by Cuyahoga County Soil and Water Conservation District. And it was really interesting when I moved back to Ohio in 2010 to, to I'm trying to get to know the landscape and, and kind of who's who and the watershed work and um, to kind of see um, you know, how they're competing with each other for grant money and foundation dollars. And um, in less than 10 years, they've really come around to developing what they call the Central Lake Erie Basin Watershed Collaborative. It's a, it's a loose, it's not an official 501c3 or anything, but the key factor is that they really work through a facilitated process to look at what are their strengths and weaknesses. They acknowledge that West Creek Conservancy is really strong when it comes to land preservation and, and easements, whereas Chagrin River Watershed Partners are very strong when it comes to local codes and ordinances. And then Rocky River Watershed Council, they're very strong in the realm of the technical and the water chemistry sampling. And so how could they leverage each of those strengths and help each other and share those resources across the board? So, Although I'm not distinctly engaged with those groups, it's been really interesting as an external partner to see them really kind of work together and, and leverage those foundation dollars for impacts across Northeast Ohio. I think, I think if we look at the, the flow of money and, and the, some of the data that uh, John showed up on, on the screen, uh, so many of the big bucks in Northeast Ohio uh, have uh, come through the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, and I say through because it's coming out of our pockets. Of course, we're paying to clean up our watersheds, uh, and what we're, we're doing that because uh, a Cuyahoga County judge mandated the creation of the sewer district back, back in the 70s, and believe me, the upstream communities did not want to be forced into this partnership with the city of Cleveland for, for many reasons, some of them not, not very savory. Uh, but that was really the beginning of a, a recognition that you're going to have to govern a watershed across political boundaries, and people are going to have to work together, and they're going to have to shell out uh, together. In terms of the, uh, the smaller organizations and the expertise that they've been building, uh, 
they really survive on much, much smaller amounts of money, and they're doing heroic work uh, based on that. And uh, as an art and architecture critic, I'm not an environmental reporter. Uh, other folks have done that, and other folks have covered the water quality issues. I'm interested in how we view things from the land side and the relationship between land uses and water, and whether we can get to it to, to see it, how we develop next to it. And the, these organizations uh, are, are the small organizations with incredible expertise have been leading that conversation and chasing much smaller pots of money. And they're doing amazing things, including building parks and, and trail networks that are, are making all of these valleys, and that's really what we're talking about, are valleys visible. These are the places we turned our backs to uh, when the region was developing uh, its, its industry. These were the places where we dumped things and places we wanted to forget. Places where we culverted the creeks and streams, covered up yep, yep. The, the natural flow of the water so we couldn't see it anymore. So we have really altered the landscape in so many ways. And it's the smaller organizations that are, are fighting that battle to, to recover that resource. So in 2000, uh, I was at the County Planning Commission and our director, Paul Sinas, and myself, we were trying to, the commissioner, county commissioners at that time had asked if, if there was anything that we really wanted to do as we entered the new millennium. And we said, you know, we really would like to take a look at the valley, Cog Valley. And um, so we, I remember we asked, and it was, it was right before midnight on the day, the, December 31st, uh, and we got note, noted uh, a note from uh, at that time County Commissioner Tim McCormick that the uh, commissioners had uh, set aside 1.5 million dollars uh, for what became the Cuyahoga Valley Initiative, and in that next several years that we had that money, we tried to uh, address a lot of issues that Steve just talked about in terms of how do we make this valley that's been forgotten, uh, literally, because it was some place to cross and it wasn't any, any destination. And how can we get people down there? How can we make it um, uh, revitalized, not only through economic development, but to revitalize the resources, natural resources that were there and as I mentioned before, how do we create public access? And a lot of those things now have happened. So Cleveland Metro Parks has been at the forefront. And I remember back when I was working with Cleveland Metro Parks many years ago that the commissioners said, we're not going north of, uh, north of Harvard Road. That's not our bailiwick. That's industrial. Leave it alone. And so there was a conscious decision not to do that. Uh, but things have changed. We have new park commissioners that have seen the benefits of this. And so we've seen the creation of places like Scranton Flats uh, along the Scranton Peninsula. We have the uh, Rivergate Complex, which includes the restaurant Ruins Wharf. We have Wendy Park. Uh, we have the boardwalks that, uh, are, that the Jacobs people had done on the West Bank. And now some of the stuff that the East Bank is doing, including the boardwalk there. So we're giving people a chance to get back to the river. Uh, they can't really touch it for the, for the most part because it's bulkheaded and you really can't get down there and enjoy the, you know, not that you at, in the past would have wanted to stick your hand in the river, but if you want to touch the water, you need to go to places like Edgewater Park and things like that. But we are seeing a whole host of uh, new users of the river, including uh, the kayakers, particularly, and canoeists, that's become a big recreational resource. Uh, the Cleveland Rowing Found Federation now has over 1,500 members. The Foundry, another organization that has uh, worked with local high schools and so on, to create interest in rowing. Uh, all these things are happening now as a result of that early work that was done back uh, at the turn of the century and that Steve had done such an eloquent job of explaining in this series that he did about why we're trying to do this. That's great. I want to follow up a little bit more with Steve um, in terms of the role of, of reporting, the role of the press. Um, if you could uh, talk a little bit more about that. I recently was at another event and, and uh, several of us pointed out that um, the day after the fire in 69, Carl Stokes held a press conference 
and talked about the, the lake and the river. And it, it was an important turning point as well uh, for people in the city. And, the, and there was a bond that followed that and, and how important it was for him to mobilize attention that, that we're going to do something about this. We owe this to the, the residents of Cleveland the people who live here to, to do something about this. So Steve, if you could talk, if you want to talk more about the Forgotten Valley series, if you want to talk about today, what you think, how the press uh, is contributing to this, that'd be wonderful. Well, uh, I'm reminded in this conversation about uh, 1969, which, and we're about to observe the 50th anniversary, that uh, the reason why the Cuyahoga River fire was the one that captured the nation's attention and became a catalyst for uh, all the environmental legislation and turned Cleveland into the Selma of the environmental movement uh, was because that story appeared in the next uh, edition of Time magazine. And I believe that the cover story was about Teddy Kennedy and Chappaquiddick. Uh, and so that was a very fateful summer. And uh, you know we also landed on the moon then. It was, it was quite, a, quite a time. Cities were uh, in upheaval. Uh, so, that's um, both good in, in the sense that it got a lot of attention, but bad because it really tagged Cleveland as a dysfunctional place for a very long time. Uh, I did this uh, project because uh, I thought the great work uh, being done uh, to, to try to bring the towpath trail north from uh, Rockside Road and from Harvard Road into, into Cleveland needed visibility. It needed uh, a kind of a thumbs up from the newspaper uh, that this was an important project and uh, that it was worthy of pursuing uh, more rapidly. Uh, at the time, uh, I recall, and, and, and I was talking about how leaders in the community can be very important, either facil facilitators or roadblocks, uh, the mayor of Cleveland, Mike White, would not give an interview on this subject, and we pursued him for months, and he just would not talk about it. This was not an interest of his. And you know, I believe it was holding back the project back at that point. It wasn't until 2008, uh, under Mayor Jackson, uh, that there was a four-way legal agreement signed between the city of Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, Metro Parks, and fourth partner was uh, Ohio Canal Corridor. Ohio Canal Corridor, uh, specifying the roles that each organization would play in bringing the towpath uh, north into uh, into downtown Cleveland and the lake. Uh, I just think, you know, it's our, our job to be writing these stories. These are important things in the community and, and to give them visibility, uh, to set the record straight and to talk about facts, uh, which have never been more important than they are today. Agreed. <laughs> um, John, do you, do you have any uh, sort of press related stories for the two other rivers that you um, talked about? Yeah, it's interesting that uh, uh, Buffalo didn't get any attention like that, and Detroit didn't get any of it, and and it just it was the perfect storm, right? The, the perfect time when media, not just Cleveland, you know, media, but national media started to cover environment in a serious way, and uh, I think Time then that was the first article for an environment section of Time magazine, you know, and so um, that's important. I'm well, you talked about uh, tipping points. That was our tipping point. Yeah. And maybe a tipping point for the whole environmental movement. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, a lot we could talk about, but um, I think you mentioned like the, you know, the, the, these champions at the local level. We need these, when it takes three, four, five decades to clean up the mess we made, right? How do you sustain momentum? How do you keep people engaged? What, what is the, there is no magical formula, but we need these champions, these 501c3s, these soil and water conservation districts, the, all of these people, and we need them to uh, have continuous and vigorous oversight over what government's doing and what they're not doing, right? We need, we need that, and then we need that voice. We need the voice to talk about future generations, too. So uh, while reporting on a, a, a follow-up about where the trail networks are, are today, uh, I met a, a terrific guy named Derek Schaefer. I'm sure he's known to, uh, to people in the room. He's the director of the West Creek Conservancy. And he told me that this, this is the only job he's ever had. He was a 22-year-old graduate of Bowling Green State University. 
and he had a degree in environmental policy or some related field, um, and just had a tip from his professor that he heard about this small group uh, that was doing stream restoration and uh, uh, conservation uh, in the West Creek uh, Basin in, uh, in Parma. He said, you might want to go talk to them. Well, 15 years later, he's 37, and he's still at it, still and at doing, it. they're doing magnificent work. Uh, he quantified for me a few days ago that I mean, they, they have uh, raised and spent tens of millions of dollars over the past 15 years to acquire you know, hundreds and hundreds of acres of land, uh, either through easements or um, uh, outright purchase or other kinds of arrangements where they're working uh, to help other organizations uh, acquire the property uh, and to, to make that land safe for the, for the future. They're doing magnificent work, yeah. And, and what I want to say about him as a, as a young guy, you know, there are people yeah. who are still coming into this field and they're incredibly right. important. Absolutely. Yeah, please. For the sake of clarity of the history, of yeah. history the real champion there was a man named Dave Winchell. And Derek worked under him for many years. And Derek uh, moved up. But Dave Winchell, just to check into the history if anybody's writing it, yeah. about West Creek, that is truly the hero who went door to door. Um, that whole thing started as a citizen initiative. So I think it's really important for everybody to remember Dave Winchell. Yes, and he's he, he's probably one of the heroes on the TV screen. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, Wayne, can I talk a little yeah, bit about this ahead. this idea of reconnecting people, you know, rediscovering the valley, re you know, the, rediscovering the Cuyahoga, rediscovering the flats. Uh, uh, um, uh, you know, th these greenways are are so Im incredibly important. In Detroit, 20 years ago, we hit the brick wall, and, 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 and we realized that we were behind other cities and greenways, you know, and, and stuff like that. And so um, some foundations came together, like big names like Kresge and Mott, and, 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 and started looking at the communities. And they said, uh, starting with Detroit, and, but all the communities, and said, you know, what is stopping you from doing this? And they said, well, you know, uh, they start with Detroit. Detroit's the largest city in the United States to go through bankruptcy, right? We have no discretionary funding. The first thing that gets, get, gets cut, no offense, is parks and recreation, right? And then they would went to these one after another, said, we cannot make the match on these grants. And so then they came back to them, these foundations, and they were just meeting quietly, no official structure, and they said, what happens if we could remove that? And they said, we would do it in a heartbeat. So they went out and foundations and corporations and raised in one year $25 million to make match on, back then, transportation enhancement grants, you know, all these different state greenway grants. So if you have a project that you want to do and you're only getting, let's say, 65% of it and 35% has to be non-federal, we'll cover that. They've now amazing they're in their second wave and that was a key to reconnecting people to the resource and getting people to rediscover you know and everything we did almost everything we could to make sure people did not get to the river yeah. and it would be most impossible to do a trail network like the towpath trail uh, we put in you know bridges we put in um, all kinds of uh, we have brownfield issues to deal with, radioactive sites like the one in Harshaw Chemical. Um, we had issues of high pressure pipelines that were all over railroads that went every which way. And to build a trail network through all that, not to mention the geography itself of you know the, the, the changes in elevation in the river and how you know how do you do how do you get a trail through there? And so people have been asking, and I in looking at your article, Steve, I. You kept saying, well, this is going to happen in five years. And that was back, what, 2001 or whatever, whenever you wrote that. Uh, and here we are, and we still don't have it done. And so a lot of people think, well, what is the problem? All you got to do is put down some asphalt, right? I mean, John, you know, we, at Metro Parks, we used to hear that all the time. Just pave it. What's the big deal? But there are all these issues, uh, real estate issues, the fact that this valley has been pretty much reserved for railroads and and industries uh, for, for the last 150 years. So slowly but surely we're overcoming that. And looks like by next 
year, uh, next summer, uh, that towpath trail will finally be completed all the way down from Zor all the way up to the to lake and actually over to Edgewater Park. So it takes money, it takes a lot of money to do this stuff, it takes a lot of patience for people like Derek Schaefer who you know, meets with the individual landowners and makes you know, deals and finds matching funds to do these things. Uh, it just takes a lot of time and people I think don't understand how complex it is to do this, but it is going to be I think a terrific summer next year when this trail is finally completed and all the connections are made and as these, the trail network continues to be built out along the river valleys that lead into the towpath, uh, it's going to be an awesome network. And I know a lot of my students here and Dr. Kellogg's students here um, don't even own cars. They go everywhere by bike and bus, and bus and, or walk. So it is amazing to see uh, how they are spreading the word that this is what people want. They want, young people want to be able to walk and bike close to things that they don't have to drive, um, like in the exurbs that you have to drive everywhere. So uh, this is, uh, I think, a paradigm shift that we are seeing now that people want to see this kind of network built out. I have to follow on to that because Jim, Jim is being so modest here. Uh, I, I approached Jim uh, several weeks ago because I knew I wanted to do uh, a more detailed follow-up to this project that, uh, 10 years ago. And so uh, I asked Jim, has a map ever been done showing the towpath trail and all the things that are connecting to it and now reaching far east and west of, of the valley? And he said, well, he'd actually done it uh, as a, kind of a personal project. So we, we're, we've taken that map now and so, uh, and we've gone to Cuyahoga County and Cleveland Metro Parks to try to quantify it and check, fact check it. And we will be publishing this information on uh, Sunday, cool. June 9 in the Plain Dealer. So cool. please uh, look for that. And Jim, I can say publicly now, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing your work. No and um, Thank you for doing it. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. been really, really fun to uh, re-explore some of this territory. I just wanted to follow up real quick on um, your comments about the access. So one unique thing about the Cuyahoga area of concern, back when they were established in 1987, um, there were 14 potential impairments that any one area of concern could have. They could have one, they could have all 14. So at that time, um, the, the local committee for Cuyahoga evaluated the state of the river and, um, and things living in it or not living in it and assigned, t picked nine of those. Um, but the unique aspect for the Cuyahoga is we also, we, I guess we didn't think our job was tough enough and we added one more, which none of the other areas of concern have because the, the federal um, US EPA didn't acknowledge it at the time, but it was that local access. So it was really interesting that those people and that committee at that time, they said, you know, it's all fine and good if we spend millions of dollars in getting rid of these impairments, but if people still can't get to the river, what's the value of that? Um, and so um, the interesting piece is that that was one of the first impairments that we were able to remove in 2017 because of those um, towpath improvements like the Scranton Flats, River Gate, Canal Basin Park and other ways that now you can get to the river. And, and hopefully by the end of the year, we'll also be celebrating the um, opening of the Cuyahoga River Water Trail. So not just within the area of concern, but an 87 mile length of trail from, um, you know, from the mouth and all the way up, 87 miles. Jen, yeah. could you just briefly mention the, the dams that have been hampered uh, access up the river and what's happened to them? Sure, so um, that, lots of exciting things in the water world. Um, so there is um, a low head dam in Brecksville. Um, some, it's referred to in different ways, Route 82 dam, Brecksville dam. Um, that's in um, combination of Metro Parks, Brecksville Reservation and Cuyahoga Valley National Park. So that is slated for removal later this year. So that will open up quite a, quite a ways of river. And then um, really the, the interesting um, and monumental project will be the removal of the Gorge Dam in Cuyahoga Falls. And um, there have already been dam removals on the river there in, the, in Cuyahoga Falls and, um, and where there is class five white water. 
and this subsequent um, removal will, you know, open up another mile of white water to connect it. So who knew in, in Northeast Ohio that, uh, and especially here in Cleveland, where the Cuyahoga, you know, sometimes is more like a bathtub effect, who knew that uh, upstream you've got class five rapids? Pretty cool. That's great. I'd like to put a plug in for your trail map and, and give you an example of um, uh, literally 10 years ago in Detroit, you know, the Detroit River is, you know, it has Windsor, Ontario, and Essex County on the other side, and Detroit, the metropolitan area, on the U.S. side. And um, we had heard these rumors of a new bridge. So Detroit is the Ambassador Bridge is the largest single crossing between Canada and the United States. More trade goes over that bridge, more trucks, more, you know, more people than any other place. And so, and that bridge was at that time 95 years old, you know, so they're going to build a new one. So, the, so um, they were going to start a planning process. And to plan for a bridge takes 10 years, right? And, <laughs> and planning. so, <laughs> planning. So we immediately said, oh my goodness, we need to get our act together. So we got all the people who loved greenways on some of them NGOs and some of them governments on the Canadian side and got together with the ones on the US side and came together and said, oh my goodness, you know, you have, you know, 400 plus miles of greenways, a trail that circumnavigates the city of Windsor and then the Chrysler Canada trail that goes out to this wine district with 30 boutique wineries and Point Pelee National Park, one of the best places to go birding. It's just a really cool thing. And we've got some cool things on the U.S. side, the Detroit River Walk and the Jewel Lewis Greenway is coming, but we're not connected in any way, shape, or form. And so they said, we, let's do a vision map. So a map, and we need the media to, you know, you are an important part of the delivery. You know, we're going to get together and we're going to help bring all the partners. We're going to make sure it's accurate. We're going to do it and everything and put it out. And we're going to then use that to show how we can speak in one voice for a dedicated pedestrian and bicycle lane on the Gordie Howe Bridge. And we got it as a result of that. We also want a, a ferry system to cross the river, improvements to the tunnel bus. But that is something that keeps coming, popping up in different circles. You mean there's actually a strategy for connecting all of us and all these unique you know, natural resource and cultural and historical places by Greenway Trail. That is just really important. I can't thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so I just have uh, one comment, and then we I want to open it up to the people in the audience. Um, all of these things you've told us about, I think, highlight the shift in how we've uh, we as people that live in near these rivers have changed how we think about them. And, and the last part you were talking about, um, we abused the rivers for a certain mode of production and didn't understand the value that we were destroying as we uh, did that production. And, and certainly the, the shift in industrial production to other parts of the United States and other countries is an, is an important part of the story of why we could think that there could be something different. Um, and that, that is, um, I don't think, a result of anything but cheaper labor and, and technology automating people out of jobs. Nonetheless, it opened up an opportunity for us to see, OK, these rivers, they're, they're not serving that function anymore. What could they be? What, what could we do with them? We've, we've abused them for so long. Um, but I think today, you know, the figures you had, John, of the a amazing amount of economic development that's been generated in these cities. Um, that's a that's a really large number um, that people have been willing to invest as they see that the rivers have been so improved and are now a place where people would want to be rather than just something that we've forgotten and we don't we don't understand them. And the the economic revitalization of so many American <coughs> cities not just in the Great Lakes, so many cities, I think is tied to restoration of their waterways. Um, there's been so many articles about young professionals wanting to move back into the city and, and empty nesters living in the city. Well, they're, 
the rivers have to be part of that story. And, and all the work that all of you have done and other people in the community to connect the rivers to all these other initiatives that create better places for people to live, um, that, that's an important part of it. It might, it might not get that much attention outside of this community that knows, knows the importance, but the revitalization of American cities is, in my, my mind, absolutely connected to revitalization of those waterways and restoration of their ecological value uh, for these cities. So that's my pitch. I guess I would make a cautionary remark about uh, focusing too much on offshoring of uh, manufacturing uh, because there are so many industries along the Cuyahoga River that are still dependent on water transport. Absolutely. Uh, in, or uh, heavy, you know, transfer of bulk materials, shall we say. There's Ontario Stone, uh, there's Cargill, the salt mm -hmm. company. Uh, there are all the companies that um, are involved in the process of making cement uh, that pile bulk materials on, uh, on docks along the river. Uh, there are tons of railroads, there are recycling industries that recycle glass and aluminum and asphalt and concrete. Uh, and all of these uh, are, are still lining their tank farms and that stuff is going to be there for a really long time. Uh, what's fascinating about the, the recovery uh, of uh, nature uh, that ha and, and the uh, reconnection of communities to the river is that it's coexisting with all of that mm -hmm. continuing industry there and we're figuring out how to do it. Uh, the, the city of Cleveland is uh, embarking, uh, I believe this summer, on a project called Vision for the Valley where they hope to reconcile conflicts uh, over these uh, different land uses along the river. Uh, now that everyone realizes and re recognizes how important it is to have a much more vibrant uh, mix of land uses, including entertainment and residential uh, and, and so on. So I think maybe in, in Cleveland we're figuring out that industry can coexist with these other uses. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, absolutely. Does everyone agree with that? Mm -hmm. that yeah. Yeah. And, that, and yes. that's what the Cuyahoga Valley Initiative was about, is, right. is how to embrace the working river. and. That's part it's of the still a working river. Absolutely, yeah. and it always probably will be. But the exciting thing about it is when you're when you're riding the towpath through these industrial areas, that's part of the experience, right? Is to see all this stuff. I mean, you can go through the national park for 20 miles and see nothing but green space. But when you get up north of Harvard, you start to see all this exciting um, things, all these exciting things that are happening. You know, you see people that are rowing on the river, you see ducks going up and down the river, you see freighters going up and down the river. Th these, are really, these are really an enhanced experience that you have and that will, will help sell the towpath uh, nationally and internationally. So certainly Akron has reinvented itself based on the restoration of the canal and, and along the riverfront down there. So that's a local example that they've done tremendous work on, on revitalization of the East downtown area. And it's a testimony to the, the power of the law uh, that will um, move people along <laughs> in terms of uh, better production processes so that we can still have those industries, but it's not, it's not ruining the water as it did in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s. I mean, it's and a, the air. And the, the air. air. Yeah, if you look at pictures of Cleveland then, oh my goodness. I mean, I grew up outside of Buffalo, it was the same thing. Um, so, All right, does anyone want to ask any of our guests questions about what they've talked about today? Joe, you'll have to shout. I don't think we have a mic back there. I'll stand up and see if the people can hear me. So my name is Joe McDonald. I'm the manager of environmental planning for Cleveland's MPO Metropolitan Planning Organization known as NOACA. And I wanted the, the panel to dig a little deeper on this topic of economic development and information shift through water restoration and river system restoration because one of the issues we face in this region which has been going on for decades now is a continued disconnect between jobs and housing. We have not grown in population as a region. We've in fact declined about 12% in the last 50 years and we've seen a continuous spread.
Anybody want to take a stab at that I one? could take one stab at it maybe uh, by talking about Opportunity Corridor, which uh, will have a bikeway uh, along the route. And um, you know, as far as economic development at a large scale with large parcels, uh, I guess that's the biggest thing I can see in the city of Cleveland right now. Uh, and um, as, as we discovered in, uh, in our mapping exercises over the past few weeks, uh, that trail will connect with uh, other trails that connect to the towpath, bringing the whole east side into the picture. Uh, and that's, that's a node where the city of Cleveland, uh, through, through its planning efforts, has uh, determined that three or four square million feet of you know, real estate could be built around the transit stations at uh, East 79th Street, both the, the red line and the blue-green line stations, uh, and, and the nearby intersection with uh, Opportunity Corridor. That's going to be finished, uh, the, the corridor is going to be finished in a couple of years. Uh, I think it's absolutely critical uh, that, um, uh, that the city be doing the, the zoning and, and land use planning and, land, and the acquisition to make sure that good things happen there and that the uh, right of way along the frontage of Opportunity Corridor, which is going to be so highly visible, uh, visible uh, isn't taken up with uh, you know, less than optimal uses. Uh, and I mention that in this context because it will be part of that larger trail network that, that we're mapping. And so I think the towpath and the rediscovery of the Cuyahoga River and the valley and all of that uh, can connect with communities that are upstream. In this case, I think it's more near Kingsbury Run. Uh, the Kingsbury Run system. Uh, so I, I, I hope that uh, is a, an interesting question, I mean, answer to at least part of your question. I'll take a shot at that, too. Uh, you, simply, you asked, if, are we doing enough? No, right? And, and I'll use Detroit as the example. You know, Detroit is an amazing place that changes right now every six months, you know? And, um, you know, it's attracted Quicken Loans and Rock Financial and, and AI to the well, train station, and I mean, just things are happening. But how do you, how do you make it a livable community and a sustainable community? And you know, the uh, how do you not gentrify? Um, how do you, you know, transportation planning, land use planning, all of this environmental planning, all needs to go together, and we're not there yet. You know, so um, the discussion right now is some of these big companies that come in, what are they doing to help lift Detroit up? You know, again, it was the largest city to go through bankruptcy in the United States. Um, how are we, um, you know, housing issues? You know, if you get a federal or state grant to rehab a built, uh, housing structure, uh, you have to give a certain number of units at affordable housing, you know. Um, uh, one of the challenges getting commuting out of the city to jobs, you know, where some of the jobs are, and, and, and we don't have the different modes of transportation that we do need. So in, from the Detroit perspective, we need to do a lot on that. We also have the issue of equity. Um, we've put a lot of our um, uh, low and moderate income people living in areas that are close to the lake, close to the river, but people can't get there, okay? And I know one of the things when we were working on the uh, Cleveland Foundation Centennial Trail, Lake Link Trail, uh, a few years ago, you know, there was like 1,500, 15 to 2,000 people, 1,500 to 2,000 people living uh, within a quarter mile of the lake that could not get to the lake. And people pretty much on one side, they have the freeway, and the other side, they have railroad tracks, and the other side, they have the old, Old River Channel, and yep, they're so close to Wendy Park, they're so close to Edgewater Park. The Lake Link Trail and the subsequent trail that's going to link Wendy Park with Edgewater Park will allow these people now to have direct access to green space, something they sorely need in those areas. So uh, we certainly have been very cognizant of how we have isolated people uh, through poor land use planning back, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago, and we're trying to change that paradigm and making green space much more inequitable, ac accessible to everybody. Yes, sir. Oh, no, we are, so what? 
was the Kelly Club's founder of an organization called the Green River Coalition, an active citizen type nonprofit organization, and one of the principal activities of this project was the impact of those citizens in the development of roads uh, to the lakefront, to the river, riverfront. And uh, you can check the uh, website, the Green River Coalition, and you'll find all the certain types of websites that can save the voices. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. One thing I wanted to mention, back to um, Joe's question, I, I'm not, I can't really speak to um, you know, economic development in general, but I, I will say that um, Cleveland Water Alliance is a very interesting organization that is trying to do quite a bit to, um, to really utilize Northeast Ohio as a, a water sector, a, um, whether it's you know, attracting companies that are using water responsibly or looking at water tech and, and their initiative with um, Erie Hack and getting um, a lot of um, you know millennials and variety of generations and diverse groups of people not just um, talking about issues but really looking at the real life solutions through um, tech development and analysis. So um, that's one that I, I feel like is really interesting when it comes to the discussion about the economy and water. Time for one more yeah, comment. Sure. Uh, so I wanted to comment also, uh, uh, following on the uh, economic development question, uh, and and also the, your sir your mention of the the Green Ribbon Coalition. Uh, there's there's a fundamental distinction that we haven't really touched on today, which is the difference between the lakefront and the river. Uh, and it seems to me we've mostly been talking about the river. Uh, in terms of redeveloping the lakefront. Uh, I, I think it's difficult. Uh, there's so much infrastructure that separates communities on the south of the, the lakefront uh, to the, the water's edge itself. Uh, so many properties have been leased to, uh, uh, to yacht clubs or, uh, or, or are industrial. We have Burke Lakefront Airport. It's, it's almost impossible in some places to get easily to, to the water's edge. Uh, and it's, it's also, we have uh, a, a lakefront that faces north into the uh, prevailing uh, uh, wind, uh, especially in the winter time. There's a long fetch across the lake and it's, you know, it's cold and, and uh, challenging to be down there. Still so is. For all those reasons, I think uh, redeveloping the lakefront uh, is, is very challenging for this community and it may be the, the uh, edge of the river in the areas touching this trail network that we've been talking about uh, that, that may have uh, uh, more promise in the near future. Uh, it is disappointing to, to see that uh, the, the city of Cleveland and other entities have spent so much money creating a, a node of uh, entertainment and, and culture and sports on the lakefront at the foot of East 9th Street. And, uh, after 30 years of, of work on that with the Rock Hall and the Great Lakes Science Center and the football stadium, uh, there's very little to show for it in terms of uh, economic development. So another area of uh, concern that I would point to uh, where, where planning has failed over the past 30 years is the area d between Erie Side Avenue and uh, the top of the bluff, Lakeside. Uh, that's, that's an area bounded by uh, East East 9th and West 3rd, and uh, there's been very little planning done down there, and that's the area where you could actually connect downtown to the lakefront. And I hope to see something on that 
in our lifetime. <laughs> yes. I have one, one story that I'm working on uh, today that uh, will be hopefully in the paper soon. Uh, there's there's a, a park, a future park that will be developed off West 25th Street uh, as part of the Lake Link Network, which is another connection to the Towpath Trail. Uh, I, Irish Town Bend Park is something that's been dreamed about for a long time in this community. Uh, and it, it may actually become a reality because of the involvement of the Port of Cleveland and the necessity to shore up the riverbank so uh, that the slope doesn't slide into the river and halt shipping. Uh, so um, there, there are efforts uh, involving Land Studio and Ohio City, Inc. to uh, do projects now even before the park can be created to activate that area and to remind the public that this is coming and to create visibility. It's uh, sort of branding, if you will. And the very first project that they're doing there involves uh, uh, a community, uh, an artist and community organizer from Sudan who is the recipient of a, a grant from the Cleveland Foundation. Uh, and she will be uh, doing a project in the community center for the Cuyahoga Metropolitan Housing Authority uh, uh, Riverview Apartments which is a long disused building. It's been used for storage for a really, really long time. And it was, it's her contention and, and those of her funders uh, that the very first project that activates the future Irish Town Bend Park should involve the people who live right next to it, which are the residents of uh, Riverview Apartments. So I think they're trying to set a tone. But you know, for the long future, this is something that's going to take uh, community vigilance. And I, just to add on to that, as I was mentioning Lakeview Terrace, which is one of the oldest housing, public housing projects in the country, established back in 1937. Um, it, it was put on this little island, like I said, surrounded by you know, industrial and railroad transportation uses. Um, so we did, when we were working on the Lake Link Trail, uh, we did meet with uh, CMHA on a number of occasions and many of the residents, we even brought them down to River, Rivergate to show them, you know, the kind of things they would have access to, and they're very excited about it because there just is not m only there's almost no green space in that particular complex, so we're going to give them access to a lot of green space in a short time. And I would like to um, build off of that and say we can create all the access in the world, but if um, the neighbors don't. Um, aren't aware of the value of getting outside and enjoying it and appreciating it, um, then th some of that work is to not. So um, from a Metro Park side of things, we do have a youth outdoors program that goes into um, after school groups, boys and girls groups, a whole array of different organizations to get underserved youth out into um, these uncomfortable settings, whether it's camping or fishing or kayaking, um, trying to do those monthly outings. And, and the, the goal is to really build um, that interest and that stewardship then to take on to the, to the next phase of life. Um, so that's one example kind of in that high school age group. On the, the even younger side, that's where our eco tracks and our nature tracks um, mobile units so that we can kind of take take the green space you know in a mobile unit um, to a variety of places throughout um, the, the city and we've done an analysis recently to look at some of those um, social factors of um, uh, what communities are facing and, and who are we really serving to really think critically about how can we better serve the community that, that isn't um, getting out into the park. Great question. 
Yeah. One last thing for me is that um, there's a former confined disposal facility at uh, located on the Great on Lake Erie, right here in Cleveland, two miles from downtown. It, it is it used to be called Dyke 14. Um, through the efforts of uh, a dozen different nonprofit organizations uh, and government agencies, including Cleveland Metro Parks, uh, and currently the administrator of that area is the uh, Cleveland County, County Port Authority. They turn that into a nature preserve, and that that particular 20 or 88 acre piece of land is now a full fledged nature preserve. And I know we worked so hard to get as many school groups as possible down there from the Cleveland School District that had never experienced a nature preserve before. And here it is almost in their backyard. And so uh, we would have all kinds of uh, environmental education uh, specialists come down there and meet with the students, show them all the various uh, types of uh, flora and fauna that patronize that site. It's just amazing to see how excited the students would be to see to be so close to nature because they don't usually see it in their neighborhoods. It's, it was an amazing revelation to you me. Know, I, I have to say, it was such a stimulating question and, and I've been mulling it over while uh, uh, our, our friends here have been talking. Uh, as part of the, sto the next story that I'm working on that we, we hope to publish soon uh, based on Jim's map of these trails, I've asked uh, Cuyahoga County Planning Commission to quantify how many households are within a half mile distance of, of uh, not only the towpath trail, but all the trails that branch from it. And if you think about this from the perspective of environmental justice, these were the parts of the metropolitan region uh, where people who, who uh, didn't have choice to, to leave. You know, a lot of these areas were, were redlined. These were communities of color. Uh, and, and now they're going to be connected to you know, some of the finest recreational amenities that this region will have to offer uh, and, and that will take them uh, uh, in, you know, through admittedly circuitous routes to the national park, one of the most visited national parks in the country. Uh, I think that's, that's got to be viewed in, as in a positive light for those communities. If you look at the history of the, the inner part of Cleveland, you're right, the, the opportunities for people there were not very great. And I, I think, I always am reminded of um, when Patty Stevens uh, was practicing here um, and first went to the Metro Parks because she explicitly started a program to have the Metro Parks look at, well, we're serving people out in the Emerald Necklace and everything's right. wonderful out there, but what are we doing for people that live in the city of Cleveland that don't have access to those those wonderful parks. And I, I think Patty's work to do that was an important step forward in thinking about equity issues. There, Cleveland has, has many parks, but there are many people who, who are not within that range of walkability that park planners like to find. They so will be now. They will be now, yep. hopefully they will be now, yes. Um, we have, there's, there's a woman here who's been asking, uh, raising her hand. We have a, just, just a minute, because then we might have uh, a lot of people coming in for classes in a few minutes, so. So going forward, um, and, uh, question on all of this, you know, getting all that I still think most people think we're separate from the environment. Environment is out there and, and an ecosystem, the difference between house and home. House is something external and detached. Home is something you see you're in even when you're not there. We need to do that. And, and people don't understand <coughs> the value of this, like ecosystem services, where that, that is something, a big education. We are limiting the benefits we get, the ecosystem services, or we're diminishing them because of what we do. And 
and we need to um, do a whole public campaign on that, and we need a new generation of young people, uh, these NGOs to carry the flag on that. Well, I guess I'll jump in. Um, um, <clears throat> one of the questions I was going to have, have these folks talk about was the role of science in all of this. And um, we are moving to a point where we will be able to monitor what's going on in these water bodies at such an incredibly more nuanced and, and uh, small level, both through sensors and satellite imagery and and moving that data into a common cloud um, so that we'll be able to know what is actually happening. In terms of Toledo's issue, um, you know, the, the farming industry is not covered quite the same way by the Clean Water Act as uh, public agencies that do drinking water and, and sewer. Um, and, and we see that the states are really struggling states in the Great Lakes are really struggling to try to figure out a way to change practices in agriculture to prevent the runoff that we saw, um, we see in the Western Basin. And um, I, I have to say, I think the lesson learned from the stories we've been talking about is that incentives are wonderful, except if they don't work, you need to have a regulatory function. And the funny thing is that we've learned from water pollution control, um, drinking water control, uh, all the work that Cleveland Water Alliance is doing, <coughs> sometimes the regulation actually stimu stimulates a tremendous amount of technology development and economic development. And I, I hope that that will be the case, that we are going to have to impose some sort of uh, changes in practices on the farming community. And it's going to be very difficult because it's, it's it's not like the end of a pipe. I think it's even more challenging than nonpoint source pollution that we've been working on because of how the fields in that part of the state are constructed because it's very difficult to collect that water. Nonetheless, if that's the main source of pollutants, um, the states will have to address it. And I, I think it will eventually take some stronger regulations, uh, working with farmers, working with the people who work with farmers, and doing everything possible and in various scales, but I, I personally don't see how it will um, change to, to evolve the way that we've been talking about in terms of our rivers and urban pollution. So I, I hope that will happen. Yeah, I think we do need the carrot and the stick, you know, yeah. And, yeah. and the carrot is go out and do it on your own time frame and everything, but if you don't demonstrate by some increment of time that you, you're doing it, uh, we're going to come in and force you to do it. It'll probably be more expensive, and it won't, you won't like it. But that combination of carrot and stick, and then where these benefit assessments come in, you know, whether it be ecosystem services or economic revitalization, they help people get enlightened self-interest. Oh, my goodness, we should be doing this. There are reasons we should be doing this. You know, so uh, that's the story of this carrot and stick of the Rouge River. It was like Cleveland. We had a, a federal judge said, okay, 48 communities, you're going to do this. I'm going to give you, you know, six years to come up with plans on your own. If you can't do it, I'm going to order you to do it. Yeah, and, and we and, had a moment like that, too. And, it, and just that, that heavy hand was needed at that point, and then that, in, it, that encouraged more creativity, and, then, and, and so that iterative going back and forth was important. All right, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It was wonderful to have you here. I hope you uh, found this of interest and benefit and uh, come back to the Levin College for forum programs in the future. We'll have uh, more things happening the rest of the summer and the fall. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Thanks.